Welcome to my exhibition, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust. I photographed 75 Holocaust survivors in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem. Meeting and photographing these people was the most emotionally challenging project I've done so far in my career as a photographer. Um, unfortunately, it is still a important story to tell, to listen to these horrific and disturbing stories is as important today as it was after the war. Anti-Semitism is coming back strong all around the world. It has been around for hundreds of years. One would think that after the Second World War, it would change, but it hasn't changed, unfortunately. It is, I think, an important lesson for all of us, not only for the Jewish community, but for the rest of the world to learn from this genocide and the stories that these survivors tell can be translated to other horrific crimes that have taken place around the world. Meeting these people is really history coming to life. The stories that I learned and heard about in high school are all of a sudden becoming personal. You, you put a face to these stories. You meet people that have gone through the things that you heard about. And I hope with this exhibition I will keep the memory in these stories alive. These 75 people represent a very small fraction of people that survived the Holocaust. They're also here placeholders for the six million that didn't survive. I hope there is something to be learned. I grew up in the 80s in Germany and we learned so much about the Holocaust. We talked about it in English classes and in history classes and German classes. And we would look at these pictures of uh, these Holocaust survivors, pictures of uh, concentration camps and to meet these people that you only learned and heard about in school, to meet them in person was truly an honor and um, it really made history come to life. You know, you really felt like you, you were there and you, um, you kind of got a better sense for what happened back then. Uh, Jona Benson was born in Poland and was uh, deported to Estonia with his dad. His uh, dad died at his hands in Estonia at a labor camp from hunger. And you have to imagine these situations, these concentration camps were so bad that they had no heating oftentimes. They had not the right clothing. They were working outside. Uh, they were cold, hungry, disease. Um, so many, many people died from, from hunger and from the working conditions. And so did his dad. And uh, he came, uh, he survived the war by himself. Everything was okay until the Germans came in and they said, Jews don't belong here. We have to get rid of them. So the first thing was to put that yellow star and not walk on the sidewalk. After a while, they decided that there are too, too many Jews in Vilna. We have to do something about it. And they put us in a ghetto. And we stayed in ghetto for a while, and after the ghetto, they decided that it's no good in ghetto either. We have to send them someplace. So they sent me out to Estonia for a labor camp, me and my father. Thank God, March 10, 1945, the Russians came and liberated us, got it out and I could walk wherever we wanted to. My father died on my hands in Estonia from hunger, from work, and he died there. And I remained alone. And that's my story. Unfortunately, it wasn't too good a story. But thank God, Baruch Hashem, I'm here. And I can tell you that. That's the main thing. It was an incredible experience meeting all these survivors, the people that you learned in school and heard in school about, to meet them in person and to get the story firsthand, to hear stories about the Holocaust, what happened in concentration camps, what life was like in the ghettos, what it felt like to be deported and the train rides to it was a very emotional uh, experience. It was very 
yeah, disturbing and sad, but when you then meet people like Bert, who's so full of life and energy and enthusiasm, it, uh, you know, it was really nice to see how life goes on, how people have survived and recovered and have huge families and are not full of hate, but are actually very positive and loving. Bert was hidden by a, a, by a French family in the mountains in France. Her parents saw that the Nazis were a serious issue. They were arresting Jews on the street. So her parents sent her off and they both worked as resistance fighters. They were uh, communists and they fought against the Nazis while Bert was living with his family in the mountains. Because of the danger I have been in, I'm very open to other people. I think that we have to try to live together, all together. Not to let hate off, you know, because these people are black or, or green or yellow or red. They are not allowed to, to live. We are there to, to live together to do each one as much as he can and to accept other people the way they are. We have to be open, open to everyone. I try to be like Madame Asana, accept everyone. I so much want a better, a better world. Eva Lavi was on Schindler's list. She uh, survived the war, being basically protected. Uh, Oskar Schindler declared he needs a certain amount of workers to work in his factory. So the Nazis gave him prisoners to work in these fact factories, and Eva was one of them. You can imagine she was only four years old, so there weren't many children on that list, only very few. And you might have seen the movie Schindler's List. Uh, this is really a movie about her. She was one of those people. They hated the Jews, really. Hate, hate, hate. The Jews for them were something between cockroach and rat. So the Nazis say, okay, if we want that they will, the women, that they will work, the small children, out, out. They will go to the Kinderheim because if they will be at home, a mommy and this, and they will cry. No, they will work what we want that will work. Not everything they want that will work. But there was Kinderheim. Children, children were together, and there were two or three women that uh, uh, look after them. And they have toys. My mother, if you tell her Kinderheim, she will be white like this, because she knows everything. She was smart. She has seen that once a week or once in two weeks, I don't remember, will come a truck and take the children, children singing and on the truck, and they went to Auschwitz. That's all. That was the Kinderheim that my mother say, you will not go to Kinderheim. Maurice was hidden by a, by a man who was an owner of a shop and he had a, a kind of a warehouse behind his shop and Maurice was only allowed to play in the warehouse so nobody would see him. The neighbors wouldn't see him, nobody would ask any questions. One day an SS officer walks into the shop and Maurice was playing and the SS officer sees him and the owner of the shop was obviously petrified, you know, to, to be hiding Jews was, you know, you, you were punished by death most of the time. 
about the SS officer, picked him up and says, oh, look at this beautiful Aryan boy, and was showing off Maurice to all the other officers and shoulders, uh, soldiers and policemen, because Maurice has these blue eyes. So there's not many Jewish people with blue eyes, and that uh, his blue eyes really saved his life. I was three years old, exactly, when my mother uh, brought me to Van den Stock, the man who hit me. Uh, and I stayed there for well close to three years. When my father came back from concentration camp, he was really a step from, uh, from death. He was flown uh, from Buchenwald concentration camp. And I thought, coming back from uh, the department store, I was expecting a big present. And no, I ran upstairs and through the open door of the bathroom, I saw strange, strange man, uh, ugly looking, really, uh, bald, unshaven, gray, gray skin. And uh, when he saw me, he extended skeleton-like, skeleton-like arms and called me, wanted to embrace me. And uh, Van den Stock said, Look, Maurice, this is your father. And I just ran away. There's a big black hole after that for weeks, maybe months. A few months later, um, quite a surprise. Uh, one Friday evening, we came home from dinner, supper with friends. And in the morning, father and the woman soldier stood next to my bed. And father said, look, Maurice, this is your mother, Helen. And I was very happy because now I had a father of my own and a mother too. And I only discovered that she wasn't uh, at my bar mitzvah. That was another nice and sad event. I wasn't expecting it. Many people were invited and it was, it was great, uh, it was really nice. Uh, but after all the guests left, uh, only mother and I stayed in the house and it was beginning to get dark. And uh, mother sat with me on the sofa and she said, Maurice, now that you've grown up, I was bar mitzvah, 13, and she said, I must tell you the truth. And the truth is that I'm not really your mother. I'm your mother's sister. And I wanted to, I want you to grow up in a real family. And that's, uh, that's what it, I want you to know that I love you. And of course I ran away, I was shocked. But next morning I got up with, <laughs> Uh, I went to mother, she was up already, and I, I hugged her and I said, Mother, you're my only mother, and you'll always be my mother. And so it was, until the very last day. Eli um, is quite the fighter. He actually fought in the resistance, in the Jewish resistance in France. He was smuggling people from places, from cities to cities, maybe even from countries to countries. And he survived the war in hiding and um, doing illegal work, always, you know, always with the fear of being captured and killed. A very proud man who didn't want to lower his chin. He always said, oh, I don't want to lower my chin. He wanted to be photographed with his chin way up in the air. But, you know, I'm trying to photograph everybody in the same style, from, from the same angle. So um, I had to talk him into lowering his chin. I'm a little bit more serious. Just relax, serious. Too serious? Little, not, not too serious. I'm Just not good at being too serious. Not too Oof. Yeah, another picture. Yeah. <laughs> almost done, almost done. It's a long wrong. time I've not been so very much shot at. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you, shall we do a couple of pictures with your hat? What? With a hat? Okay. If you want yeah. to. It's very characteristic. It's a French beret, okay. which shows I was in, in French resistance, salvation resist, Jewish salvation resistance for 13 and a half years. 13 and a half? No, three and a half years. Three and a half years. Which was long enough. Yeah. yeah. Should we do this video with a hat or without? Like you sure are costing like a, a lot of ammunition. Yes. Shooting <laughs> 100 times. <laughs> that you do not let me smile is very... Not nice. ...troublesome. I'm accustomed to doing everything with a smile. <laughs> but the subject matter is pretty serious. Okay, well... <laughs> Okay. That I am smiling is not making it less serious. On the 27th of January 1945, Auschwitz was liberated by two Russian soldiers. The Russians had some heavy fights outside of uh, Auschwitz and they didn't really quite know what they were going to find. They pretty much by accident found Auschwitz-Birkenau. Two Russian soldiers pulling a sled walked up to the gates and found 7,000 prisoners that were still there, among them a few hundred children. And um, when I heard that Marta was still in Auschwitz that day, was liberated, I, I had this picture of children at the barbed wire fence and I said, Marta, are you in this picture? And she's like, yep, yeah, that's me and that's my sister. That's when, uh, you know, when you're, you take a deep breath and it's history becomes personal, history comes to life. And it, um, it was shocking to find out. Imagine, I have a smaller sister, younger sister, Ruth and Renata, that I were born 41 and 42. And imagine taking a child that age uh, such a young child and just handing the child over to a total stranger for all you knew they would murder them because that's the way we were saved and uh, we were sent all over Czechoslovakia in hiding. I was lagging behind and uh, I, uh, my sister waited for me which she wasn't supposed to do and that's how we were caught and sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau on the, in, uh, I mean, we were caught on my birthday on the 10th of October and went straight to Auschwitz Birkenau. Then we were liberated, what, 27th of January, 45. Sounds like a little time in Auschwitz, but believe me, every minute was like a lifetime. Gad was maybe the funniest uh, person out of all these 75. He is also a photographer and he took great interest in my work and how I was taking pictures and made little jokes about my camera. He is from Tunisia and it really opened my eyes to learn that the Nazis had a, the primary goal was to kill Jews all over the world, not just in Europe, but even they put him as a child in a, in a camp in Tunisia. Another woman here, she lived in Indonesia and was uh, arrested by a, the Japanese and put in a camp in Indonesia. So it, you know, it, it really makes a, brings a point across that the Nazis wanted to kill all the Jews around the world, not just in Europe. <laughs> שיספר ושיכתוב למען הדורות הבאים, כי זה אחד מהדברים הכי חשובים. אני כבר כתבתי ספר אחד, ואני מתכונן לספר השני, סיפור אומנם על המשפחה שלי ואיך גדלתי, אבל בתוכו אני מספר על הזוועות שהיו בתוניסיה. בזמן הגרמני, במזלנו שהם לא נשארו הרבה זמן וככה שהם, הארץ שלהם הוא לא היה חזק ועמוק 
אבל בכל זאת 580 יהודים שנלקחו לעבודות לא חזרו הביתה. וביניהם אפילו הרבה קרובי משפחה שלי. לכן אני מספר ואני אומר לכולם כמה שאתם יכולים לספר עוד ועוד ועוד למען הדורות הבאים עד יומנו האחרון. תודה. Naftali is quite a, a special man. He still has a lot of energy. He, he opened my show here in Essen. He came from uh, Israel to be here. And uh, he survived four different camps, work camps, and he even survived the death march from Auschwitz to Buchenwald when the Soviet troops were approaching Auschwitz. The Nazis put most of the prisoners on this death march to, uh, in the direction of Germany and uh, in the middle of the winter, so not many people survive, but uh, he's one of the few. Wenn ich komme her nach Yad Vashem, immer man, man bringt mich her und ich soll ihnen erzählen, waren da Journalisten, waren da Polizeiten, waren da Judges, waren da, wie sagt man, mhm. und Lehrerinnen Lehrerin und Lehrer. Und so mache ich es. Jetzt habe ich zu dem Zeit. Mhm. Ich weiß, dass viele, was war, waren da, kommen schon nicht, weil sie können nicht kommen. Es ist mir auch sehr interessant, von wo haben, hat man 75 Leute noch können zubringen zu euch hier ja. fotografieren. Ja. Sie haben ja, sie haben 25 Überlebende, ja? 75. 75, 75. Ja. Das ist auch nicht noch ein, zwei, drei Jahre. Ja, wird schwieriger, noch ein Wir sind schon die letzte Generation, was mhm. kann doch gehen und erzählen und ja. etwas sagen. Das ist ja auch so wichtig, dass man ihnen zuhört. Ja, und wichtig, dass man nicht fotografiert. Ja. <lacht> und viele Leute sagen, das war nicht. Das ja, ja, hat genau. nicht passiert. Ja, ja. Okay. Das ja. machen wir gerne. Machen Alles wir Gute. Auf Wiedersehen. Vielen Dank. Okay, auf Wiedersehen. It was really a pleasure meeting Hannah, this beautiful, elegant lady. She was born in Berlin and she still speaks perfect German, even so she hasn't lived in Germany in many decades. She first fled, her family first fled to Amsterdam and they tried to hide in Amsterdam once the Nazis invaded Holland. She met Anne Frank and became friends with her. She was later deported to Bergen-Belsen, a concentration camp in Germany. And Anna and her met a couple times at night at a fence in, uh, in secret. But uh, Anna Frank, as we know, didn't survive the war, and, and Hannah is one of the few people that survived. I met Anna Frank in Bergen Merzen, but we didn't see each other. We were in different camps, uh, but they were bored at the end of the war when the Russians came nearer. The Germans didn't want that they see what's happening. And they emptied the whole Poland from Jewish people and brought them into Germany in camps. And Anna came to Bergen-Belsen, where I was already, because we had some papers, and so we were in Bergen-Belsen to be exchanged. But it didn't come so far. And then the people came from Poland, and next to us there was built a big uh, tent, there was no room and then all the tents blew up in a wind, and my camp had to give half to 7,000 women from Auschwitz. And somehow from November till February, I didn't know that she was there. In February, somehow people started to speak, and someone told me, your friend Anne Frank is next to us. I couldn't understand, because the rumor was they were to Switzerland. There, the grandmother lived. And so at night I went to the fence 
and very careful it was forbidden and there were Germans at the top and uh, I start to call hello hello and really a Dutch lady answered me and it was a lady that was together with Anne and Heiding and so she knew me we lived in the same street in Amsterdam and with only half a minute it was very dangerous but it was dark and so she said oh you want Anna I said yes and she only added Margot and her sister I cannot bring it's very near but she cannot walk it anymore but I bring Anna and really after several minutes a very sad voice is calling for me and it was Anna first thing we both cried and then I said, how do you come here? I know you are in Switzerland. She said, we never went to Switzerland. It was just a rumor the Germans shouldn't look for us. We were in hiding in daddy's office. And then we spoke about the family. And at the end, she asked if I can help with some food. So we didn't have much more. But the first time and the only time the Red Cross sent us a package, it was in February 45. And so everybody gave me nothing, but you know, it was, um, how do you say, a lot, a lot. So I came with such a little thing and I couldn't see her, so I had to throw it over the fence. And another hungry lady caught the package, ran away. And Anna was shouting and, and awful. So I promised we will try again. I could once more so we had three meetings and that was it then she got the package but when then my father died and I didn't go there when I came again end of February everything was empty they were brought in Bergen-Belsen to another place and I didn't know what happened to her anymore till I came back to Holland then her father was already back and the first meeting we had, he didn't know that Anna will not come back. But later he heard from the Red Cross uh, that they died, both the girls and his wife. The wife still in Auschwitz and the girls in Bergen-Belsen. Tja, and he made this Anna Frank house in Amsterdam. And they do very good work. Anna, as a survivor of the Holocaust, what is your message for future generations? That all people are created in the image of God and that we are all the same. If we have another color, another religion, we should try to live in peace together. It's very hard, I know, but we should try more. Beautiful. A picture is the fastest way to get a message and emotion into your brain. And this is why pictures are so successful when it comes to telling stories. Sit up straight, tall, beautiful. It's all about the power of faces. You know, you get fascinated by such an image and suddenly you get a story. Born in 38, right? 39. Oh, 39. It is nice. Most of my, my jobs are for magazines. I, I'm an editorial photographer photographing famous people, you know, athletes, musicians, actors. Besides these assigned jobs, I find personal projects that are meaningful to me. So I was sitting at a bar with a friend of mine, Kai Diekmann. And while we were talking and I told him I have a Jewish wife, he said he's a chairman of Friends of Yad Vashem. We came up with this idea right then and there to photograph 75, the Holocaust survivors. Next year marks 75 years of the liberation of Auschwitz.
everything was okay until the Germans came in and they said, Jews don't belong here. You want to ice right here? You're doing great, you're so strange. So they sent me out to Estonia for a labor camp, me and my father. Then my father, my father died on my hands in Estonia from hunger, from work, and he died there. And I remained alone. How many grandchildren do you have? Ten. Ten grandchildren? Right now, ten. Well, ten grandchildren you're not getting anymore. Two more great grandchildren. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's my story. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Near Ira. Where macht Ihnen Ihr Frisur? Ich habe eine gute Frage. Ich habe das seit 30 Jahren. Aber jetzt werden die Haare ein bisschen dünn. Bald muss ich sie alle abschneiden. Growing up in Germany, in high school, we talked about nothing else. It feels like we talked about the Holocaust in English, in French school classes, in history, obviously, in politics class, in German class. We grew up with this incredible sense of guilt and really shock and questioning one's identity. How come that the people from my country have been able to commit these horrendous crimes? It's very scary to see what's happening in Europe right now that anti-Semitism is coming back so, so strongly. You know, I feel more responsible than ever to make sure something like this can never happen again and to fight anti-Semitism wherever I see it. Were you at Auschwitz when it was liberated? Yeah. Wow. We were, my sister and I, I was with my 13-year-old sister. And we were in Mengele's barracks. It was beyond description, my monster. Did you guys give me that picture out of my, uh, the, the newspaper? You're not, you're, you're not in this picture, right? You... Yes, we are. You are? That's my sister, Eva. Oh, my gosh. And that's me. We were 10 and 10, 13 year olds. I remember seeing a woman, and she had a little child next to her. And uh, these two guards were laughing. The next thing we saw, they went to the woman, pulled the child away from her, put the child on the floor, grabbed one arm and the opposite leg, put his boot on the child's stomach and pulled the child apart, literally apart. That's the sort of thing that was going on all the time. And somehow we survived. It was pure luck, really. So you work at the museum pretty much every day? You come here to? Yeah. Every day? Every day. Wow. You have a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, I don't intend to lose uh, in a day of my life. OK, where are you from? Uh, I'm Israel. I'm Israel. Uh, 1941, Germans were arresting Jews on the street. So my mother one day prepared for me a suitcase. I thought I was going on some sort of vacation. Okay. I was taken to a farm. In that farm, I met a lady called Madame Machana. I was nine years old. We had the food, we were safe. I got my own room. There were three children. There was a son, Marcel. And I can tell you that he has been my big brother for the next 70 years. I can only thank Madame Machana with all my heart. Because I could have been one of these million five hundred thousand children. There is only smoke left of them. And I owe her my life. We've got a 
big challenge now that the survivors of the Holocaust, they are getting fewer and fewer because, you know, simply they are now in their 90s, uh, over 100 years old. So we are losing their testimony. And to make their stories available is extremely important. And this is everything Yad Vashem is about. We have to use this testimony to connect these experiences with youngsters who are coming to learn. Very important. Young people have to be part of that responsibility to fight against racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism is part of it. Is that a Hasselblad that you're using? No, it's a Mamiya. It's similar to a Hasselblad. I was three years old when my mother brought me to the man who hit me. When a father came back from concentration camp, and I went to live with him. A few months later, we had a visitor. She called out Moishele, that was my name as a baby. And uh, she hugged me and kissed me and began to cry. And father too began to cry. And father said, look Maurice, this is your mother, Helen. Truth is, uh, Helen was my mother's sister. Mother died in Auschwitz. She discovered that her sister had died, so she looked for ways to find me immediately. To find a sister's son. She was my only mother and always be my mother. And so it was. I am the youngest girl in Schindler List. The war ended, <laughs> 45. We sit there in the factory. Schindler prepared for every one of us a pack, put a blanket, vodka, something to wear, not to go like prisoners, that everyone will have something to start. It is not in the Schindler List film, but it's true. I put him with my mother and with God, you know. So I'm here in my resistance group in France and I'm the only male. All the rest are Jewish girls. I was in the Jewish salvation resistance for 13 and a half years. 13 and a half? No, three and a half years. Three and a half years. Sit down just a little bit. What? A little bit lower? Yeah. I am not good at lowering my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, your and your mother and your brother did not survive? They did not survive. How did you survive? Oh, today I have children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren. I have turned my life to build up a country for my people and defend it. And again, I am one of a generation. I arrived in Israel a very long time ago went to the market. All the people there were Jews. I suddenly understood that I had been in hiding all my life. And it has been a very special feeling to be part of, in France, I was never part of. My son is a PhD in microbiology. And I always say that from the ashes of Auschwitz, maybe my son will find a, a solution of uh, this terrible sickness called cancer. So four so, kids. I have four kids. Great. 22 grandchildren. 22. Masa she wishes you a lot of luck. Thank you. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. You turn it into a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very well. Shalom. And for Thank your you. smiling and for your being the way you are. I do think you have a responsibility for your history. You know, if everybody looked at their own history and tried to learn from their own history and tried to use that knowledge to better themselves, to better a society, I think that's what will bring us all as humans forward.
So this was, uh, I think, eight years, eight days after I left the ghetto. And it was two days, not two days, one day after my dad left me alone in the forest. How many people were there? She wants to add that uh, people were evil. They suggest me to... I forgot. To choose her form of death. The form of death, oh, Hanika, or to 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 burn her, to burn me. And I was very, very frightened, very frightened. I don't like it. And I was frightened, especially because I. Yesterday I was with my father, and now they want to kill me, and I am only myself. And I said to myself, I want to, I want, I want to, to live. I don't want to, to, I want to live. I very want to live, because my father tell me that I must live. 